Welcome. I've been asked by PNR to shoot a promotional video about Ted Turno's new book, Popologetics, Popular Culture in Christian Perspective. In an attempt to keep costs down and to find someone who is truly knowledgeable about this project, I decided to interview myself. So, welcome, Ted. Thanks, Ted. It's really great to be here and there. Let's get right down to it, shall we? This title, Popologetics, it's rather odd, isn't it? It sounds like the cross between a plush animal company and an IT firm. No, not popologetics. 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 Oh, like apologetics, but with pop, because it deals with popular culture. Exactly. And you thought that was clever, didn't you? Um, you're sure it's not an L. Ron Hubbard thing? After all, it does rhyme with Dianetics. No, I mean, it does, but it's supposed to rhyme with apologetics. Okay, so it's an apologetical approach to popular culture, right? Correct. Perhaps you could explain for the folks out in YouTube land what apologetics is. It doesn't have to do with apologizing, does it? <laughs> no though I've heard that one before. So have I. Um, yeah. I would define apologetics as the art of presenting the Christian worldview in a context of unbelief. So it's all about understanding systems of unbelief, critiquing them, and then presenting the, the power and the truth and the beauty of the Christian worldview. Isn't that something that usually happens when talking to believers of other religions? Yes, it does. But I see religion happening all over the place, including in popular culture. So popular culture is religious? You mean like the Church of the Jedi? <laughs> there is such a thing, you know. I know. You were saying? Oh, I mean, it's not just Jedi churches. At the heart of all popular culture is religion. But by religion, I mean something far broader than organized institutional religion. All cultural expression, at its heart, has at least religious implications, even when it doesn't seem to. How so? Well, each piece of popular culture projects an imaginative vision of life. It proposes a way the world is and the way the world should be. Each piece of popular culture presents a perspective on ultimate reality. You mean a worldview? Yes, popular culture deals in worldviews. That's what they are. Imaginative visions of the world that influence the way we think about the world, God, each other, even ourselves. In a sense, Popular culture is a type of worship directed by these ultimate beliefs. That's why it's appropriate to engage it using apologetics. So popular culture is not trivial. Not trivial at all. I mean, a lot of it doesn't have a lot of depth, but some of it does. And even the shallow stuff isn't trivial in the sense that each piece of popular culture projects an imaginative world that beckons us, that invites us to come inside, to live there, at least for a little while, for the length of the song or the movie or whatever. And that influences our worldviews and the worldviews of our friends and neighbors. This sounds pretty abstract. Could you give a short example? Sure. Let's take the example of your typical rom-com. Rom-com? Oh, sorry. Romantic comedy. You know, like Nora Ephron's Sleepless in Seattle. It doesn't seem religious at first. No, it doesn't. It's just your typical boy meets girl story, or girl hears about boy on the radio and then stalks him because she thinks he's the love of her life. R r right. But what worldview, what religion does the movie propose? That if you find the right guy, the right girl, the right lover, then your life will be happy, fulfilled, full of meaning, full of promise. In other words, 
romantic love is elevated to the position of a virtual god. An idol. Precisely, an idol. But it's also important to realize that popular culture isn't just about idolatry. Romantic love isn't evil. It's a great gift of God. I'm all for romantic love. I romantically love my wife and have done for a long time. Hey, watch your sweet talk. She's my wife too, you know. The point is that it's a gift of God and it should be treasured for what it is. But try to make it more than that and it becomes an idol. Romantic love never was meant to give us ultimate meaning, a purpose for living. That's God's job. That's God's domain. What idolatry does is it takes some good gift of God, some fragment of his grace, and twists it into something it was never intended to be. And it's important to see both the gift and the twistedness. Absolutely, if Christians are going to respond to popular culture without simply dismissing it as evil or idolatry, then they're going to have to understand these gracious gifts of God that are woven into popular culture as well. After all, that's why popular culture is attractive. Popular. So, what should Christians take away from this book? Well, several things that popular culture is all around us and it influences our worldviews and those of our friends and family and therefore it deserves to be thought about and talked about. If instead of treating popular culture as a source of mindless amusement on the one hand or a tainted cesspool of sin and idolatry that we might catch a disease from on the other, if instead of that we could treat popular culture as a complex, influential, imaginative human creation that deserves careful consideration, a, a messy mission field of meanings that deserves to be engaged rather than ignored or dismissed, that's what I want people to take away from my book. Because only then can we speak into our culture and have something relevant and insightful to say. And why would we need to say something relevant and insightful about popular culture? Well, because as Christians, we're called to our world. Being able to talk about popular culture, which is, after all, where most of our friends and neighbors live, where some of us live too, being able to talk about that stuff that can lead to all sorts of good places. It can lead to important discussions with your kids, with your friends, your coworkers, even yourself. It can lead to inviting a bunch of non-Christian friends over to watch a movie or a television show, and then talking about issues that come up in what you watched. Or listening parties when, uh, when an album is released. Or talking about video games you love or websites, or whatever. Popular culture is a great opportunity to talk to people about stuff that matters where they live in a world filled with popular culture. And more often than you think, these discussions can lead people into new ways of thinking about who God is, who we are, what we're doing on this planet. <sighs> Sounds deep. Isn't this just for theologians or philosophers? Not at all. It doesn't have to be about deep theological or philosophical issues. It just has to be about human issues. And a lot of the time, people are more willing to talk about these sorts of issues when it's in a song or it's on a screen. It's less threatening. Look, once you get the hang of it, thinking about popular culture comes naturally. It's not rocket science, but it does require some careful thinking. So, what else is in this book besides an apologetical approach to popular culture? Well, I begin the book by talking about concepts that will play a big role throughout the book. Um, what's a worldview? What is popular culture? How do these two things interact? And I try to lay out a theology of popular culture. A theology of popular culture. 
Yeah, what does the Bible have to say about who we are as culture makers and culture consumers? Mm -hmm. What does God have to do with culture? You know, that sort of stuff. Okay, and what else? The second part of the book is more critical. I look at the ways that Christians have typically dealt with popular culture. And how they're wrong because you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. I wouldn't put it quite that way. I think there are plenty of things we can learn from. No, you think you're right and everybody else is wrong. He thinks he's right and everybody else is wrong. What is this? Are you from 60 Minutes or Between Two Ferns or something? And what else? Uh, I, um, well, in part three, I lay out my own approach. The right one. Um, the apologetics-based one, anyhow. That's where the title comes from. Papologetics, that clever title. So I lay out my own method, papologetics, and I give examples of what it looks like in practice um, with popular music, film, Japanese animation, even social networking. And then I wrap up the book by giving a few suggestions about how to use this stuff practically. Uh-huh. That sounds like a lot to cover. How long is this book? Um, about 450 pages. 450 pages?! What are you, Tolstoy?! Well, you don't have to read it all in one go. And, and what do you have to lose? PNR is selling it for what? 20 bucks? Hmm. If you do the math... That's only 4.4 cents per page. Not bad. Especially if you consider that some online booksellers are hawking it for even less. So what you're saying is, it's not a big risk. Only if you're afraid of thinking deeply about popular culture. You calling me stupid? No. You calling them stupid? No. So are we done here yet? Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? No, I think that pretty much wraps it up, except for me to say how stupid your glasses look. What? I thought they looked rather, you know, retro hipster? Hipster. Yeah. Well, that about wraps it up, folks. That's all the time we have. I've been talking to Ted Turno about his new book, Popologetics, Popular Culture and Christian Perspective, due out from PNR April 16th, 2012, which is soon, unless you're watching this after April 16th, in which case it's out now! Uh, you can check out a preview of the book on the website, that's www.turno.cz, that's www.turnau.cz, uh, because I, I mean, we live in the Czech Republic. So, thanks for joining us. Take care!